we'll go on today for just a, a pretty much of an introductory day. The first thing um, that I wanted to do was to, uh, we'll make sure that everybody's, I, I'm pretty sure probably everybody's read the sutra and um, maybe even studied it some before this, but I, I wanted to, to show a few videos actually uh, that I thought might be interesting because the Heart Sutra, like Buddhism itself, it's it's uh, we can't pin it down, of course, to any one time or culture or uh, school of Buddhism even. So it's really, you know, a mirror for ourselves and a mirror for um, practice, a mirror for reality, really. So I thought it could be interesting to uh, just watch a few videos of of people chanting the Heart Sutra from different cultures. So hopefully this will work, we'll see. The first one would be the one that um, I'm most familiar with and some of you might have been exposed to. And this, these are Soto monks uh, chanting the Heart Sutra. And some of these I'll have to you know, stop a little early before they go on because they go through several times and uh, We'll just want to listen to it maybe once, but let's try this. I don't know if you guys could hear it so well. I had several uh, videos to to show uh, uh, people chanting from different cultures and different languages, but I don't think I'll try it because it didn't seem to, to work so well. But I'm not sure if you could um, 
hear that so well or not, but it can be pretty moving. Um, what I might do is uh, after the meeting, send you out the links. So, I mean, you can also find these things on your own, but uh, there was just a real contrast between some of these uh, ways that the sutra is chanted. And one of the ones that I thought was really cool was that there was a uh, really devotional rendition by this person named Fei Wong in China. And she had like the, an orchestra behind her. And, um, you know, it was a contrast between, for example, the uh, a Tibetan monk throat singing the Heart Sutra. If you're familiar with that kind of, you know, singing, it's very deep and to me, it's kind of like masculine and just otherworldly almost. And then to contra contrast that with this um, young woman singing this very sweet, devotional, and moving uh, piece done with a full orchestra it was like quite, quite amazing. But it il illustrates to me how you know the sutra is is our life. It's not meant to be some kind of abstract thing that we refer to in, you know, in theory, but it's uh, reflecting our life and we, um, you know, we make it, we realize the sutra in our life according to our, our own um, heart and mind. So anyways, I said, maybe I'll send those out to you, but uh, this is a general introduction you know, exploring a little bit more, why do we study this sutra? And for me, it's uh, very clear for me that it's the source of my faith, for lack of a better word. Um, it's a place to return to. Uh, it's a place of refuge. Um, you know, uh, we can say so many things about practice, but uh, you know, this is basically the heart of our practice is the Heart Sutra, and I think that's part of the reason that uh, you know it's called the Heart Sutra. So it's this place of return, for example, when our life falls apart, and I think that most of you have probably had this experience of things seeming to just completely fall apart in your life. And, you know, I'm at the age now, I'm almost 60 years old, where I've had it happen several times, you know, in my life over the years where uh, life doesn't have any uh, discernible meaning for me. Like, there, I can't fit it into the narrative of what I have created for my life. So... All of us have this kind of narrative, of course, that we create for our life to make sense of it. Like, what is our place in the world? What are we uh, trying to express in this life? Um, you know, what is our image of ourselves? How do other people see us? And uh, if we live long enough, I think sooner or later, um, you know, that's going to fall apart. And so where do we where do we find our refuge when that happens? Uh, I mean, I could talk about it on several occasions, but probably the most recent one for me has been um, within the last few years, actually. I, um, I had a student, I had somebody who came to Gilbutsuji who, um, you know, was very, enthusiastic and was actually living there and uh, we had you know a good relationship things were, were working well and um, she had come from from out of state to you know to practice there and we were talking about her becoming a, a, a long-term resident and um, anyway to make a long story short um, this tragic thing happened where she um, she had these really intense allergies, and she uh, 
she had a really strong asthma attack and as a result of that actually passed away because of this um, this asthma attack. And that was directly related to coming to Gyobutsuji. And uh, I've never, you know, I never even knew actually if I would ever relate this story <laughs> publicly or, or not again, because I've never been able to integrate it into my narrative of what it means or how could it be related to my uh, expression of the Dharma, you know, everything that I've kind of created in my life to, to express the Dharma and help help others, you know, as, a, as, my, as part of my vow. It doesn't fit into that narrative at all. And I don't, there's no way that it ever will. But I think, you know, the, it's at the times like this when we take uh, refuge in these uh, teachings, uh, the teachings themselves are actually, you know, practice. Actually, the practice and the teaching are one. And um, that, that's the only, you know, this is the only refuge that I have for, for uh, meeting that particular uh, Occurrence in my life, so I'm sure all of us can can relate to these kinds of things. Uh, you know, the Buddha taught about the nature of life as suffering and and loss, and um, you know, sooner or later we're going to have some kind of deep loss in our life. So I think this uh, sutra is relating directly to that. Um, You know, on some level, and that is because on some level, these Prajna Paramita Sutras or these Prajna Paramita teachings are telling us that on some level, uh, you know, things are, things are okay. No matter how bad it seems, no matter how uh, much suffering there is in the world, on some level, there's okay. You know, I think about the last uh, four years, especially in our society have been so um, difficult on, on many levels. And uh, it seems that we're really entrenched in our own view. You know, we're really entrenched on being right. And uh, this, uh, this sutra is the medicine for that that kind of thing, you know, uh, our society today could really use a, a big dose of the Heart Sutra. Uh, and so, you know, it's telling us that no matter how right we think we are, basically, this is the one of the many things it's telling us. I mean, what it tells us is beyond words, of course, but one of the things that we can talk about that it's telling us is that Really, uh, no matter how right we think we are, there, on some level, we're wrong. And, uh, you know, <laughs> that doesn't mean that we can't do anything or that we should give up. But it's exactly the opposite of what it's saying. But it's uh, a humbling and um, um, how, what's the word for making a universal, making us understand our universal connection in our, our uh, humbling, the humbling comes in to know that we're just a tiny part of this vast, you know, vast whole. We may be, you know, on some level, there may be some way that we, of course, have to have relatives truths or we are correct in certain ways. We have to say, well, we're, we're correct in certain ways or we have to have an agreement that certain things are, are correct. But on some level, we always have something else to learn. We always have another perspective that we can take in. We always have uh, a bit more space, a lot more space for our heart and mind to open. So this is one of the basic teachings of this sutra, I think. Um, so Sawaki Roshi, who was a very important you know, Zen master in this lineage uh, that I'm in, that many of us are in, for example, he said, uh, although Abhitama Buddha says, 
that's good, don't worry. None of mankind will lose his or her way. Don't get irritated. Still, mankind is always crying, oh no, this is no good, what am I going to do? So Amitabha Buddha is the representative of, uh, you know, Prajna Paramita, for example, or for this ultimate truth that the Heart Sutra is talking about. So we're, you know, we're kind of scrambling around and wondering, you know, what to do and saying, uh, you know, life is hard and we're fighting each other and competing with each other. While Abhitabha is there saying, it's okay, you know. So um, that's one of the that's one of the ways that we can talk about uh, this this heart sutra. So let's see. Um, time is going very fast here. This is a basic introduction. You can, uh, if you want, the historical background of this sutra, the the Red Pine Book that I recommended there has a detailed history, and it's very good. Um, as I said, the Heart Sutra is one of the um, Prajnaparamita Sutras, and it uh, first is first shows up in uh, written history, it seems, around 200 or 250 AD in China. That's the first uh, record we have of it. Um, so some scholars think you'll hear that the uh, Heart Sutra, the Prajnaparamita, teachings were developed to kind of supplant, you know, or, or um, yeah, to supplant the original teachings of early Buddhism. You know, you'll hear that, that they're somehow um, the greater teaching. But I actually don't uh, think that's true. And this is largely due to the fact, you know, that the Heart Sutra goes through and systematically negates all of those basic teachings that are in the Pali Canon or the early, you know, Agamas that like the Four Noble Truths and the 18 Elements and the 12 Fold Chain and uh, what's the other one? Um, anyway, all the early teachings, uh, it goes through and says that these things are not, they don't exist or they're not true or something to that effect. We'll study that. But uh, Actually, we can, I think we can think of uh, the Heart Sutra as further expounding the Buddhist teachings. And there are, you know, there is kind of a, a school that Nagarjuna, for example, who is considered, you know, the really uh, foundational figure in uh, presenting the Prajnaparamita uh, sutras or teachings was really just trying to go back to what the Buddha was actually intending to say. And I think that, you know, that's really true uh, from my perspective. Um, Nagarjuna lived around uh, sometime in the second century, uh, current era. And, um, you know, there's a period of early Buddhism where uh, things got really insular and, and um, you know, the Abhidharma period where this really deep, profound, or sort of more actually specialized or technical approach to the teachings were developed. And it almost seemed like nobody could understand what it was about, except for a few, you know, select monks that were living in monasteries. Uh, so, one view is that Nagarjuna was trying to go back to what um, the original basic teaching of the Buddha was beyond all of these kind of technical things. And, you know, through those technical, um, through that technical kind of grasping, he felt like uh, the original teachings of uh, the Buddha were kind of corrupted and misunderstood. So, um, you know, there's a, there's a story like the legend is, is that Nagarjuna, um, well, that these Prajna Paramita Sutras, these profound, these more, these really deep teachings about emptiness, there were some 
legend that they were lost, that the Buddha taught them and that, you know, the world wasn't ready for them because if they're misinterpreted, they're actually more dangerous than, than not having any teaching at all. And so for some period, they were lost, you know, and uh, the, Naga, the Nagas, who are these mythical creatures uh, in, that go way back in, you know, ancient Indian culture, um, took these uh, sutras down into the ocean and uh, protected them for, you know, some centuries. And, you know, the Nagas are kind of snake beings, like snake-like beings that were part snake and part human, like water snakes, I guess. But so I think it's a, it's kind of a, a cool metaphor because we, you think about um, going down deep, you know, the ocean is like a symbol of uh, depth and profundity and also a teaching of, um, you know, ultimate truth, like universalism, universality. The ocean is often used, you know, in that way. Um, let's see, since my other toys didn't work out, let me see if this other toy will work out where I can show a picture. I thought it was a cool picture of uh, Nagarjuna painting of him. Uh, this isn't really relevant to the... Um, discussion other than just I thought it was cool if I can get to that let's see so there he is I just thought this was a, a cool picture and this was painted like in the early 20th century like uh, by some European artist I can't remember now but um, that's Nagarjuna there of course with um, the Nagas, and I think that's the Prajnaparamita Sutras there in the middle. Um, so back to the, uh, you know, the Prajnaparamita teachings. Um, um, we can say that these draw out the, you know, the Buddha's teachings and uh, these are very deep and profound teachings, but there might be some truth to the fact that they can be dangerous if we don't have the right perspective, if we don't uh, understand you know, the real teachings meaning. So for example, um, here's a quote by uh, a, a Soto Zen master from the 16th century, he said, uh, the uplifted sword has no will of its own. It's all emptiness. It's like a flash of lightning. The man who's about to be struck down is also of emptiness, as is the one who wields the sword. Do not get your mind stopped with the sword you raise. Forget about what you are doing and strike the enemy. Do not keep your mind on the person before you. you. They are all of emptiness. But be aware of your mind being caught in emptiness. So this is an example, I think, of how the emptiness teachings can be misinterpreted and can be very dangerous. It used... Uh, to say, well, it doesn't matter if we kill someone else because it's everything is empty and uh, it's okay. We're all one, so I can kill you and it's fine. So Nagarjuna himself said, um, you know, the cure for being stuck in dogmatic views, that you know, one of the basic problems that the Buddha said that we have is our attachment to views. In, under, in other words, I, my view here, I'm right, you're wrong, I know reality and you don't, and I need to uh, make sure that my view of reality prevails over yours. 
that's a very um, you know common approach. So he said that actually the uh, remedy for that teaching is the Prajna Paramita teaching, the teachings of emptiness. So, but he said, uh, being stuck in the relative view, I mean, being stuck in the view of emptiness, he said there's no cure for that. So he made, he made a very serious, you know, deep statement that uh, it's very, you know, it's very dangerous if we somehow feel that, um, you know, for, if we somehow get stuck and misinterpret these emptiness teachings. So um, we're getting close to ending our time here. Um, I just want to talk a little bit about, maybe uh, we can prolong this to next week too, a little bit about the title of the Heart Sutra. So in Sanskrit, the title is the Maha Prajna Paramita Hridaya Sutra. So um, maybe I think you have the copies of the sutra that I sent out there. You might be able to see that. I'm not going to try to screen share again today. I think I'm through try experimenting with those, that thing. Um, so I think it's pretty interesting because we can actually probably see uh, most of or all of the teachings of the Heart Sutra just compacted into the title. You know, if you really pay attention to the title of it, you will see really the basic thing that the Sutra is communicating. So Maha, for example, this is an old term, you know, used in Indian languages. I don't uh, know any Indian languages, but um, this is an, uh, an old term that, you know, is often used as an honorific. Um, also can mean great or boundless or vast. In China, when this was translated and commentaries were starting to come out, you know, in, in China, this maha became or became clear that this maha meant something beyond comparison or it meant um, everything, you know, there's actually nothing we can say about this term. It's, it's, uh, the universal, the universal truth. So, um, Maha is a place where comparison doesn't mean anything. You know, there's no way that we can say there's size, any particular size or shape or value to anything because in order for us to compare things, there has to be something to compare it to. But in Maha, everything is included, so there's nothing to be said or compared about it. Um, you know, Uchama Roshi had some funny things to say about it. Um, you know, usually, of course, our normal way is to compare and make comparisons, but those are all relative things. So he said that he read an interesting, interesting article one time about the testicles of fleas. And he said that actually the, uh, the testicles of fleas are quite big, you know, compared to other insects of that size or and compared to the size of a flea, the testicles are, you know, quite big. And um, he said, he, you know, he just thought it was interesting to think uh, anything to do with a flea is big. Uh, but, you know, compared to, um, you know, quantum physics or to neutrinos or something, of course, a flea's testicles are gigantic. Uh, and the same time, you know, um, even the entire Earth is tiny compared to the sun or co compared to our solar system or the entire galaxy or certainly compared to, you know, the universe. We know that the Earth is a, tr a tiny speck that can't be even, you know, seen in comparison to the rest of the universe. So this maha is the place where no, you know, no comparison can be made. Um, 
Vajnav, of course, is usually translated as just simply wisdom. But this is an interesting word because it means, um, well, let me back up a second. Uh, you know, in early Buddhism, prajna or wisdom is the point of practice. So we're ignorant beings and the cause of our suffering is this ignorance. So we practice, we learn, practice, and wisdom arises and this is the medicine for ignorance. And that's the point, you know, practice in early Buddhism. But um, actually the word prajna is a compound word, pra meaning before and jna to meaning to know. So this is wisdom before knowing. So this is the wisdom before discrimination, before um, cutting reality into subject and object. So it's an interesting way to think of the uh, wisdom, of course, as being something that doesn't have anything to do with knowledge in the way that we think of it. And that's because this actually prajna is the reality itself of, of, of maha. This is like the, um, this is another word actually for maha. Uh, so, you know, Uchamaroshi again to refer to him, he, he uh, talked about uh, this prajna as reality before we cook it with the mind. You know, it's the difference between a, a, uh, a live swimming fish in the ocean and a fish that we've cut and put into our uh, frying pan and we're about to eat it. Or one way we can talk about it is, you know, in the normal way that we think of wisdom, we made a wise choice on that pur purchase or we made a wise choice on the stock market, or we made a wise choice even in, you know, what school uh, we send our children to, whatever it might be. But this is a, com a completely different kind of wisdom. Uh, you know, we might talk about the wisdom to do things well in society or to actually the wisdom to practice in a certain way, the relative wisdom to practice with mindfulness or showing up for zazen or uh, coming to a zoom meeting to talk about the dharma that's sort of a, a map for reality or actually the words of the heart sutra itself is kind of a map for the reality but the reality itself is the, the territory is uh, you know not the same thing as the map or is much more than the map so if we, the problem is, is that we usually uh, dis, uh, we confuse the map for the territory. You know, it's a really a problem if we um, are on the road and we, uh, you know, watch the map and we're driving the car and we, we don't look where we're driving. And that's a real problem. You know, you know, if you look at the GPS rather than staring you know, at the road, but at the same time, without a map, it's very difficult to get where we're, we're going. That's what Nagarjuna said. You know, these relative truths, we can't actually approach nirvana or maha unless we uh, take some relative perspective. So um, this is prajna, the, the wisdom before, you know, before knowing. Paramita, so we're, on, we're it's quitting time here, so I'll be fast, but paramita, we're, we usually uh, translate that as perfection. But again, in, um, in China, the commentators actually said that paramita means to cross the other shore. So in Buddhism, you know, the traditional teaching is, of course, we have this shore of samsara and, you know, suffering. And we have the other shore of nirvana, the end of suffering. And between those two, uh, play, not places, the, between those two realities, there is a river that we cross. And usually, um, you know, we use something like prajna, or we use the Eightfold Path 
was the, the early metaphor was we use this eightfold path uh, to cross the river between samsara and nirvana. We use that as like a raft. And then once we cross, when we reach that other shore, we can discard the raft. But, um, you know, when we study the Buddha's life, he, he practiced the Eightfold Path up to the day that he died. You know, he was always talking about the Eightfold Path and he always taught, he always practiced the Eightfold Path. And so we learn from that, that actually the path itself is this expression of Maha or this expression of, of truth itself. So yes, uh, we need to walk a path, but that path, the walking that path itself is the expression of uh, Maha or the expression of, of reality. And the Buddha showed that with his own life, you know. He also, before every, before every uh, talk that he gave, he sat Zazen. And so why did, you know, why did he do that? He was the Buddha. Uh, he didn't need to attain anything. So, um, we'll go then to the Hridaya part of the, the uh, heart. Of course, the heart usually means the, the central part of something, the core, the essence of something. And I think that's true. Uh, it's the teaching, you know, this is the teaching that keeps Buddhism alive. Uh, it's the, the beating heart of um, of the teachings. Um, also, though, I like to think of it um, that this is the teaching that opens our heart to, that opens our heart and mind. You know, in Japanese and in uh, Chinese, I think too, when the, this the character that represents this, there's no distinction between the heart and the mind. You know, those are one thing. But uh, this is important, though, that because of that first thing that we read about the Zen master saying that, you know, it's okay to kill someone because of emptiness, this is the medicine for that. But there really is no wisdom without compassion. There is no wisdom without the heart opening. It's very uh, clear. There's no compassion. There's no true compassion without wisdom. And there's no true wisdom without compassion. In fact, these are exactly the same thing, just looked at from a different uh, perspective. So, you know, if, uh, for example, in, um, it wasn't so long ago that people thought that the way to end systemic racism was to just not pay attention to race at all and treat everybody the same. And so that was the cure because race is a, is a social construct and there's no biological basis for it and just ignore it completely. And um, that's the way to, to address it. But of course, that's, you know, that's uh, some kind of ultimate wisdom that's true. There is no such thing on, as race on, on some level. From another perspective, you know, certain people have had a big disadvantage in this country because of, uh, you know, the color of their skin and their ethnic affiliation. So we have to see uh, each other and we have to see our differences in order to offer each other um, our, our practice. So it, said, it says that, you know, Kanzayan or Avalokiteshvara, but, uh, Bodhisattva, that, who is in this sutra, has 33 different forms. And that means really innumerable forms that he or she will manifest according to the needs of each individual being or each culture or each um, society. So it's true, we're all human beings living one life, but we're also different uh, beings that need different things and so we what i might need what i think you might need is not the point the prajna and the wisdom uh 
and compassion have to be there. So we, we allow some relative knowledge of people to come into our heart and mind so that we can make an offering. So um, I think that's a lot of what this uh, hridaya or heart means, actually. At least that's what it means to me. So um, I'll stop here as an introduction. And if folks want to, we have a, some time if uh, folks want to stick around to uh, make any comments or uh, have any questions, uh, we can do that. Just one thing, somebody asked about Nagarjuna and how to spell it. It's N-A-G, N-A-G, J-U-R-N-A, right, sure you? Right, I think so, N-A-G, okay. Nagarjuna. I've heard it, I think it can be pronounced Nagarjuna too, it's just depending mm -hmm. on the, you know, there's different ways of uh, pronouncing it. <laughs> I'm not sure why. Different cultures, probably. Yeah, I yeah think that's just some people. Pardon? I think that's just some people mispronouncing it because Sanskrit is has a specific way it's pronounced. Okay. All right. <laughs> but it doesn't. We're not living in ancient India, so it probably doesn't matter that much. <laughs> Yeah, he won't. He won't care. Nagarjuna won't won't be offended. <laughs> uh, sure, are you. I, I was wondering um, earlier. You were talking about how you know the legends of the sutra was guarded by all this stuff, and that there would be a time and a place to learn this. Like, oftentimes when folks do study a little bit of Buddhism, they kind of misinterpret the emptiness that's taught in it as a type of nihilism. Is like that philosophical approach to our practice, the, the warning label on the sutra that you were talking about earlier? And if so, like what would be, what do you think the big missed hurdle or misunderstanding between nihilism and this type of emptiness that we attempt to understand would be. Yeah, yeah, that's exactly what it is, a kind of nihilism. And, um, you know, when we study the Buddha's teaching, he's very clear. He, uh, we can go back to ancient, you know, the ancient, the earliest written text in the Buddha uh, clearly negated, you know, nihilism, but the way that, you know, the way that I really like to talk about it, and I think which is the origin of these Prajnaparamita sutras is, um, I sent it, I think I sent everyone a copy of it. It's the Kachayana Sutra, Sutta, one of those. And so, it's a very simple teaching uh, about emptiness, and but very profound, you know, when we think of it. And so, basically, in, uh, in that sutta, the Buddha tells Kachayana that one who is awake, you know, when they see the they see the arising of the world, or they experience the arising of the world or the self, that is the cure for uh, nihilism. So, in other words what we do matters when we um, teach others and we take care of our children or we take care of our dharma ears or we take care of our uh, friends and you know it matters how we take care of our life because we see life arising we see new new people new things being born uh societies developing we need new um uh, policies to adopt to a changing society. We can't, you know, stay in the old ways. But at the same time, you know, we see things passing away. So we see past, you know, the 
the arising of a society or the arising of the self is actually the death of the self too. You know, the arising of, of a 60 year old Shoryu at the end of this year is the death of, you know, 59 year old Shoryu. Or, and so like in a way, uh, the 13 year old Shoryu is way long gone. But um, anyway, so we, th we see things changing, passing away, and we can't grasp anything as the self. You know, we can't grasp my 13-year-old self, or we can't grasp uh, 1950s society before uh, the internet as the way things need to stay. You know, we have to adapt to uh, global globalization. And so that is a cure for um, eternalism or dogma, you know, a dogmatic view. If we say things have to stay the same because this is the right way, that's a problem. Or if, if I try to hold to the views that I had as the 13 year old boy, that's a problem, you know? <laughs> I mean, I think there are sometimes probably I do still, but uh, hopefully not for very long, but um, I have to see that the 13 year old boy is passing away. Mm -hmm. So the emptiness teachings actually, you know, they don't say that there is a self and they don't say there is no self. You know, there's kind of a confusion that is being stuck in nihilism when we say there's no self. And um, actually the Buddhists taught this uh, emptiness of the self the was the middle way itself. So the cure for nihilism is to, uh, is seeing cause and effect. And the, the, the uh, cure for, you know, <clears throat> dogmatism, or eternalism, you know, or idealism is to see change and see emptiness, you know, see, uh, observe, you know, the death of the so-called death uh, of the self, for example, or the death of the, that's what we mean by beyond birth and death. This teaching is actually beyond, you know, birth and death. So if we stick in either view, we think that death exists. And if we, you know, if we stick to another view, we think we have eternal life or, you know, <laughs> kind of thing. Yeah. Um, if I can ask a clarifying question that might be elementary or it might be really hard, I don't know. I'm really new to most of these ideas. So uh, I, I read Red Pine's book on the Heart Sutra, which I found really uh, interesting and like, especially from a historical perspective, I learned a lot. Um, I think maybe I'm getting this from there, maybe not. Maybe I'm confusing it because it's been a few weeks since I read it. But I think that uh, my understanding of emptiness, and this is probably like very much a reductionist idea of emptiness, but what I was able to conceptualize is that it's sort of not necessarily a teaching of I mean, like, like you, you were saying, maybe like no self, but the idea that uh, it's almost an idea of like uh, sort of oneness, but maybe uh, I think the 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 um, analogy that helped me at least kind of conceptualize it was more that like things are sort of like mirrors that are reflections of things around them, and so things exist because of other things, sort of like a cause and effect understand for me I think it was like the idea of a tree falling in a forest and there's nothing there to observe that does that tree really fall um am I like on the right path of understanding what that concept means or am I really really veering off the wrong direction yeah I think those are that's those are good ways to start talking about emptiness you know whenever anything we say about it is is off of course that's a, a very old um zen sort of uh, tenant that, uh, you know, anything we say is off, but we have to say something out of compassion. You know, wisdom, 
says, just shut up. But compassion says, we better say something, you know. Uh, but one of the things you might be uh, talking about, like the Indra's net metaphor or imagery uh, with the reflection, because one of the ways to talk about emptiness is, um, you know, it's in, it means impermanence in interconnection or uh, interconnection or, or non-self is usually what we say, the way it's often said is non-self and inter interconnection. I mean, that impermanence in uh, non-self. So yeah, if you think of that, that's really the two sort of aspects of, um, you know, that we can say verbally what emptiness is, but uh, another way to talk about it with an image is Indra's, you know, the, the old Indra's net uh, anal uh, image or um, analogy or metaphor where, you know, it said that Indra, the king of the gods or the devas or um, has a net in his palace that is actually the entire universe, a net that, that spans the entire universe. And um, at each juncture of the net, each knot where, you know, the net comes together is a jewel. And each jewel reflects every other jewel infinitely in the net, plus the entirety of the net. So uh, that's a way to talk about emptiness or interconnections. Um, so each jewel that you pick up is is an individual but also the entire net itself and plus everything um is reflected in that so from it's true you know from one perspective uh we don't exist at all you know the net uh, each of those junctures actually one way to talk about it is a knot in the net is just the condition of the the net you know, a knot is just the way that a piece of rope or string is tied together. Uh, it's, you know, you untie it and it's not there. It's just a condition of the net or, uh, you know, a, a bubble is another kind of metaphor for that. A bubble is nothing but air packed in a, in a bit of water. Um, and it's just, you know, but really, you know, it's very clear that it's just a condition of air and the relationship between air and water is a bubble. Another relationship is a cloud, air and water. So, uh, but, um, but clouds are really there. You know, we talk about clouds and predict the rain, of course, you know, through those. And if we don't have some knowledge of um, rain patterns and when to plant the crops, you know, we're in a, or have a big problem, but uh, at the same time, you know, they don't really exist, the clouds in, from some certain perspective. And they're, they're conditioned by the, uh, the sun and, you know, the wind and particles in the air or all of those things, you know, clouds can't exist without um, innumerable other things. And then each drop of the water, they say, has been around since I think the beginning of the earth, you know, the, all the water that we're using now has been around like countless ages. It doesn't go anywhere. It just is recycled in some way and, and takes another form. But um, yeah, there, there's all these different ways that we can dance around the emptiness teachings and kind of point to what what it means, but it's just actually talking about the, the reality of our life and the way it unfolds. And um, it's a very simple everyday thing, but uh, we often don't take a look at it to, you know, to understand the profundity of it and the beauty of it. Yeah. 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 Um, one of the things that kind of was coming up for me <clears throat> as you were talking uh, earlier was <clears throat> I don't know if anybody's kind of probably all of us have had an experience where we we like learned our practice and 
and maybe learned how to ring the bells or learn how to offer incense in one center. And then you go to another center and it's like completely different, you know? And, and I think that the <clears throat> idea of emptiness kind of hit me <clears throat> when I started noticing my mind, you know, starting to think, oh, well, they're doing it wrong, you know, or, oh, they should have things this way or, you know, that way. And then, you know, kind of hit me that those are, again, just my ideas and of, uh, and I, you kind of have to let those go because in this environment, in this situation, things need to work this way so that it can function properly, you know? So it's like being able to, you know, let go or um, see the emptiness of our mental thoughts and formations is, is the ability to then react or respond to what's needed in this moment not relying on what we've, you know, has worked in the past, like, because um, it keeps changing <laughs> what's, what's yeah. different, what works now here is, it may not be the same thing that, that even works, you know, in the next moment. So <laughs> yeah, um, just continuing to let go and, and kind of swipe clean or, or just um, realize that, that what our thoughts are, are just that they're just what we think it's not necessarily what's real or what's um you know in front of us now so that's how i think of it though yeah it's a really important part of it i think uh because you know as i was, as I was saying earlier the, the buddha the way the buddha talked about it is he said that one of the the core sources of our suffering is an attachment to views and we're you know we're really attached we really like to be right as human beings we really like to be uh more correct than somebody else i think i mean it's just kind of a human instinct it's not like um you know a bad or wrong thing if we experience that but we really need to practice to um to go beyond that, I think. Uh, and so, yeah, I mean, it's a really great teaching that it's one of the reasons I think that we, we do practice with these formal, these formal ways of doing things because you, you learn something and you think it's the right way and you go somewhere else and you see that it's done a different way. <laughs> and each temple does something according to conditions of that temple. You know, like the size of the building or the number of people there or, um, you know, that's the compassion part. So the wisdom part is there's a certain way, you know, or there's a certain way to express, uh, you know, our practice in, in you know, in emptiness. Um, there's a certain way that we're trying to express it by doing full, being fully, you know, present in this moment and putting our entire heart and mind into it uh, but there the relative part is is that there are many different ways to do that but at the same time you know we don't want to get caught in the place of like well anything goes whatever i do is okay we were talking about this the other night there has to be some guidance there that's when the guardian has said was that we can only approach the absolute through through the relative teachings. So um, we we wouldn't have anything to talk about today at all if it weren't for relative truth. Uh, and um, and the you know the Heart Sutra is a relative uh, construct or a relative um, piece of work you know ex that expresses emptiness. And it's part of the reason that I wanted to show those videos of uh, chanting, because I think they, the Heart Sutra ex at first was considered a mantra. I mean, it still, still is, you know, kind of considered a mantra or something that's, that it's not a necessarily teaching us anything intellectually, that the expression of it itself is, is an expression of emptiness. I think that's really, you know, really true. So. Uh, when we chant it, we don't, we're not thinking about, you know, the intellectual aspects of emptiness or Indra's net or Kachayana or um, anything. We're just expressing 
emptiness. <laughs> and uh, that's that's the sutra there, really. That's the you know the unfolding of reality as it is. Uh, we need some practice to do that. You know, really, usually, I mean, we need some some practice. Uh, it's not just like you know anything goes usually for human beings. Um, so, uh, how do we express this emptiness in in actual life? Um, uh, like uh, we hear things like forget the self or uh, not having preferences, likes and dislikes. Um, in in regular life, uh, how we act is like based on let's say aversion or uh, attraction. We, things that we like, dislike, uh, our actions are based on that. Um, but if we act based out of emptiness or based out of not believing this story of um, uh, of ourselves, the narration, uh, how do we act? Like, uh, like what, what guides our actions? Like, how do you mean, like, how do we uh, how express emptiness? Like, what is our motivation or what is our yeah yeah what drives right like for example right now what drives me is like my likes and dislikes or, or the thought process uh, that's what drives things but if i don't believe these thoughts or if i don't believe this story or if i uh, want to act out of the emptiness right like uh, what, what what guides if not the likes and dislikes well, I would say probably what I would say, and I should have mentioned this earlier, that um, actually this, I think this sutra is about our, our Zazen uh, practice. So, uh, you know, Zazen is just another way of, of saying, you know, practice, of course, but for Soto Zen, um, you know, we, we really ground our teachings and practice in Zazen. So, uh, zazen is, uh, we don't do Zazen in order to, to express emptiness or to live a good life. Rather, you know, we uh, live our life as an expression of our Zazen. So, um, first of all, I think it's very essential to have uh, a practice of emptiness, you know, a practice where we're focused in sitting in reality and grounded in reality. And so uh, in, in the core practice of Zazen is letting go of our own, our viewpoint, like being stuck in our own viewpoint. But in our Zazen, we don't uh, push it down or say it's no good. We, we allow everything to come up and we receive it, and then we uh, we allow it to run the course of emptiness. It stays around for a while, and it then it dissipates. And uh, other things come up; they stay a while, and then they dissipate. You know, that's emptiness. That's the the teaching. So once we um, once we start grounding our life in that way we we aspire to allow that to ex express uh in other ways that we conduct ourselves you know in other ways that we uh, interact with the world so dogen zenji the way that we like to talk about it uh is through vow uh, this is the source of our vow you know this heart sutra to uh, live our lives based not on me or the individual self or my agenda, but but based on this emptiness, or or we can talk about it as uh, you know interconnection or Indra's net or Abhitabha Buddha or Barochana Buddha, or you know we can say it in a more positive way because sometimes emptiness sounds a little uh, harsh to people, but. <laughs> Um, so, you know, Dogen Zenji talked about the three minds, for example, you know, uh, we, we might, we'll study this probably later, but, you know, magnanimous mind, uh, nurturing mind and a joyful mind. And he talked about those, you know, in his, in the Tenzo Kyokun where, uh, he, he was talking about cooking. 
But Uchan Maroshi, you know, they they he published a book called um, on the Tenzo Kyokun called How to Cook Your Life. So so Dogen Zenji's talking about you know how to cook your life basically. So these three minds are one way, you know, that we can study how to allow our zazen practice to uh, manifest and guide us in our life. You know, uh, San Shinji, we're, you know, is named after these three minds. You know, San Shin is, means three minds in Japanese. And so it's a very important teaching. It's the way that we uh, do our bodhisattva practice. We um, live based on vow. And um, that's what you're, you know, it's a very excellent question. It's, and it's actually, you know, Dogen says, it's the question that reality is asking us in every moment. How do, and how do we respond uh, in every moment? You know, it's a koan, that's Genjo koan, he calls that. And um, so how do we respond uh, based on this vow to express uh, emptiness? rather than my own individual agenda. So, you know, we can talk about, the, we'll talk about the three minds later, but you could study the Tenzo Kyokun would be one thing too, or Ucha Maroshi has those books on, uh, you know, how to cook your life. Um, but we'll, we'll talk about the three minds probably at some point, but the, the main thing is we, understand how to let go of our uh, our views while you know that's the wisdom part then the compassion part how do we implement our views in the service of wisdom so it's directly related to our zazen practice you know how do we how do we um uh speak to somebody not in a conversation, not to win, but rather uh, connect uh, with our shared life. You know, how do we speak in a way that um, expresses emptiness with another person rather than, you know, we get to know it after a while. Am I sitting here thinking about what I'm going to say and how I'm going to trump what they just said in their argument? Or am I listening to them and trying to you know, continually taking it in, letting it go, and trying to engage in a uh, an expression of of uh, sh a shared life. So it's directly uh, connected to our zazen practice, I believe. So um, it's a it's a great question, and it's the one that we're all trying to answer every moment. <laughs> you know. How do we, how do I live well, you know, in this particular moment, how do I express, express it? But the foundation, the, the most basic thing is our Zazen practice for in Soto Zen, we must, you know, we're grounded in our Zazen practice. Thank you. You're, you're welcome. So I think it's um, time to stop. It's past time to stop. And unless uh, anybody had anything uh, they wanted to say before we leave. If not, if not I'll just say thank you very much for being here. And I've, I've enjoyed it. And thank you for being patient with my uh, amateur Zoom management and uh, <laughs> have a good weekend. And uh, I look forward to seeing you again when my conditions are right. Thank you very much. <laughs>